Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. It is episode 69. So can I get a nice? Nice. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) We're like 13 year old boys, I swear to god. Oh my god, it's awful. Although it did remind me, I was like, I know we're some ways off, like probably, I think I did the math and if it's, if it works out to about 50 episodes a year, we'd be uh, like eight years away from 420, something like that. But can you imagine when we get to episode 420? <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Okay. We can start the nominations now. Yeah, absolutely. We will collect <laughs> ideas until the day comes. Absolutely. All right. So, okay. Oof. First of all. <laughs> All right, so today's topic is, um, it's an interesting one. Yeah, and we've kind of been saving it specifically for today's fun little milestone. Dear listeners, today we are going to be sharing the tale of Sada Abe. Sada Abe was a Japanese woman who became best known for not only killing her lover via erotic asphyxiation, but for slicing off his penis and testicles and then carrying them around with her wherever she went until she was caught. You heard that right, folks. And honestly, that's all the intro you're going to get because we are just dying to get into this. I mean, this story really has everything. Sex, murder, and dismemberment. Not to mention a whole lot of drama. All right, so let's get into it. We've had her on our list for a little while, but she really seems to be a great choice for episode 69, number one, because I am a child. And <laughs> I feel like we need to celebrate our 69th episode with a story like this. But number two, dismembered dicks, you guys. Like, this is a wild one. I mean, what is it that Lady Gaga said? It's something like, I don't wish to glorify a murder, but I am for the empowerment of women or, you know, like words to that effect. <laughs> Something else that I think makes this story interesting is that the feelings that the public had and still has about her are pretty split. Some consider her a horrible murderer, while others see her story as a tragedy of true love. But yeah, um, just a heads up, guys. This story is going to get a little bit gory, but also incredibly sexual. So yeah. Uh, Yeah, um, buckle up. Okay, so Sara Abe was born on May 28th, 1905, so this is an official old-timey crimey. Woo! She was the seventh of eight children born to Shigeyoshi and Katsu Abe. Her parents were no strangers to tragedy at all. Only four of their children would survive to adulthood, Sada being the youngest. This led to her parents doting on her quite a bit. The Abe family wasn't considered rich by any means, but they lived an average upper-middle-class lifestyle that they sustained by working as tatami mat makers. Which is a fun little tie-in to our Om Shinrikyo series. Shoko Asahara was also from a family of tatami mat makers. He certainly was. And something interesting about her dad is that he was actually kind of adopted into the Abe family when they were younger. He was originally brought on to help with the family business, but he would eventually become owner of the company. Shigeyoshi was described as an honest and upright man by police, but was known as a bit of a womanizer who is considered kind of self-centered by a lot of people who knew him. We don't know a ton about her mother's early life, but we do know that she didn't really get into any trouble or attract any sort of negative attention onto herself. Her father wasn't the only one who seemed to like the attention of others. Her brother, Shintaro, was known around the area as a ladies' man, although this didn't affect him too negatively. But thanks to good old-fashioned hypocrisy, her sister, Taruko, was punished quite extremely because she had dated numerous men. Yeah, so her dad was basically like, Oh, you like sex? Great, I'm sending you away to work as a prostitute. And he did. He eventually came back to get her, but he essentially forced her to sell her body as a punishment. Which is absolutely awful. You know what that reminds me of in, like, the worst, most exaggerated way possible? Mm Mm-hmm. The parents who, like, find out their kid's smoking, so they're like, I'm gonna make them smoke the whole pack. Totally. It seems completely counterproductive to the pun- Like, the punishment doesn't match the crime, if that makes sense. Like, calm down, you guys. Back to our girl Sada. Like we mentioned, from a young age, she was quite spoiled. 
Her parents enrolled her in singing and shamisen. A shamisen is a traditional Japanese instrument, and both of these activities were strongly tied to geisha culture. As she got older, she became more and more difficult for her parents to handle. The change in her behavior seems to be tied to a pivotal event in her life. Sadly, Sada was sexually assaulted by an acquaintance of hers at the age of 15. Her parents were supportive when this happened, and they defended her in the community. However, her behavior began to dramatically become more and more problematic. In 1922, when she was only 17, her parents sold her to a geisha house in Yokohama. And a quick little explanation for all of you, just in case you're unfamiliar with what a geisha actually is, because there are quite a few misconceptions. For starters, she was not hired to work as a sex worker, at least at first. A geisha is a class of traditional Japanese performing artists and entertainers. They are trained in various styles of music, dance, singing, and also hosting. They're often hired to perform for wealthy clients and sometimes even large festivals. That is, if you are a successful geisha. Unfortunately for her, Sada joined the geisha house later in life than was ideal, and therefore did not receive as much training as her counterparts. Because of this, she was considered a low-class geisha. This meant that she was selling her body, but was being paid a little bit more because of it. She was seen by doctors regularly to ensure that she was healthy, but she did contract syphilis around this time. Her new profession led her to Tobita, a famous Osaka red light district. Once again, her behavior grew increasingly problematic. She spent the next two years stealing money from her clients and just overall causing drama everywhere she went. She was able to leave the industry for a little while and worked as a waitress, but eventually went back to sex work. So when she was working as a geisha, she was essentially making like pretty decent money. And on top of that, she had like a giant supply of people to steal from. So when she was working as a waitress, she essentially had none of that. And it just wasn't the same for her. So this time she began working in a less reputable brothel in Osaka in 1932. This one was operated illegally and it didn't quite have the level of security and safety measures that she was used to. Tragedy struck the Abe family once again the following year with the death of Sada's beloved mother. She went to Tokyo for the funeral, and while she was there, she realized that if she worked there as a sex worker, she could easily make more money. So she relocated and began to work in a brothel there. This was when she became a mistress for the first, but certainly not the last time. Her father passed away in 1934, and she actually took care of him up until he died. Afterwards, once again, she returned to the brothel. Okay, so let's pause here for a moment. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't seem like things are going well for Sada at all. Uh, no. So far, I would say we haven't really said any positive things, really, have we? <laughs> Not at all. So, okay, one evening, while she was working at the brothel, there was a huge police raid. A few of the women managed to get away, but Sada wasn't as lucky. She was arrested, and it was looking like prison was in her future. I would not want to go to a 1930s Japanese prison. Oh my god. Oh, 100%. Luckily uh, for Sada, the owner of the brothel had a very powerful friend named Kinosuke Kasahara. He took a liking to Sada and he used his connections to help her out. She was released shortly after without even a blemish on her record. This, of course, came with a price. He was attracted to her and despite the fact that he was married, he wanted to be with her. Soon after this, he persuaded her to become his mistress. And if you thought this story wasn't messy so far, I have a feeling it's going to get real messy from here on out. Okay, so sometimes I'll say stuff like, oh, this is one of the most difficult stories we've ever covered, or this is one of the most gory or whatever. This shit is <laughs> it's so crazy. fucking dramatic. Oh, man. So her new man, he paid for a place for her to live, and he would often give her money. This, of course, crashed and burned very quickly. <laughs> we found part of the testimony that he would give to the police after everything happened, and we just had to share it. Apparently, Kinesuke wasn't afraid to kiss and tell. He said, 
<laughs> Bear with me, you guys. This I have is... to say, okay, when I was working on this script, I was like, if we can get through this without giggling. Oh, impossible. Ooh, there's, okay. you know, there's a lot of dark parts of this story. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But there's just some times where it's like, you couldn't write something like this. No. All right. Good luck. Go okay. Ahead. So he went on to say, she was really strong, a real powerful one. Even though I am pretty jaded, she was enough to astound me. She wasn't satisfied unless we did it two, three, or four times a night. To her, it was unacceptable unless I had my hand on her private parts all night long. At first, it was great, but after a few weeks, I got a little exhausted. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I got through that, guys. That I'm a champ. <laughs> I was trying so hard. I'm so proud of us. Okay. <sighs> So she demanded that he leave his wife for her, and he, of course, refused. He essentially wanted to be able to have both of them, but wanted complete commitment from her. Since he couldn't keep up with her, she sat him down and explained that she needed more. She was essentially like, look, you can have two women. Why can't I have two men? And he forbade her to do so. Which is pretty hypocritical, but okay. This essentially was the final nail in the coffin for her, and she packed her bags and left for Nagoya, Japan. In the same testimony, he said this about her. She is a slut and a whore, and as what she has done makes it clear, she is a woman whom men should fear. How poetic. Ooh, that sounds like almost like Team Rocket-esque. <laughs> no kidding, like a, <laughs> like a rated R <laughs> Team Rocket. <laughs> oh my, I kind of like it, okay. She would later refute this by saying that he essentially just used her for sex and that every time she tried to leave, he would cry and beg her to stay. Guys, we said this story had a lot of drama and you can tell we were not kidding. <laughs> In the later months of 1935, Sada attempted to leave the sex trade. This time, she was able to get a job working as a cleaner in a restaurant. She became close to the customer of hers named Goro Omiya, Goro was a well-established professor and banker who immediately took a liking to her. Sada ended the relationship with him shortly after she left this job. However, he would visit her in Tokyo again. He actually helped pay for her to get treatment at a hot springs to cure her syphilis. Can we talk about that? So I think at this point in time, oh man, I've looked this up before. I'm going to look it up again real quick, but I don't believe penicillin would have been around at this point in time, but let me just confirm that. So actually, I mean, penicillin was discovered September 28th, 1928. Okay. Now, that being said, I'm not sure when, like how long it would have taken to distribute after that, but it may not have been readily available to most of the world, right? So I guess, you know, the hot springs, maybe, I feel like we talked about this before, did we not? Hot, hot springs having healing qualities? Eben Byers. Yes, that's what it was. But here's so I, my thing. Can we backtrack? Mm -hmm. You're telling me you're going to take a bunch of people with syphilis and put them into a hot springs together. That many people are sharing. <laughs> That's I'm stuck on the very basics of this equation here. Oh, man. I mean, it doesn't seem super sanitary to me, but perhaps in those days they were very much um, like it's flowing down a mountain. So maybe, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't want to be downstream of the uh, syphilis pool. I'm not sure what to say. I don't know. I just, <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, let's go on. Goro, at this point anyway, was becoming more of a friend to her. He saw how badly she wanted to get out of the sex work industry and suggested to her that she look into a better job at another restaurant, with the end goal being that she open up one of her own. His advice led her to look for an apprenticeship. Sato was done with Kinosuke at this point and had moved back to Tokyo. She wanted a change of scenery from what she was used to from before, and she decided to take an apprenticeship at a restaurant. This was when she met Kichizo Ishida. Not a great day for old Kichizo? Not at all. Kichizo was the 42-year-old owner of the restaurant that she began working at. He was a known womanizer, and from all accounts, it looks like his wife mainly ran the entire business while he was gallivanting around hitting on women. A real stand-up guy, we could say. 
It didn't take long until he began making advances towards her. It started innocently enough, but soon after, it turned into full-blown propositions for sex. At this point, she was freshly single and sexually frustrated, so she gave in. Their first sexual encounter was at a machai, also known as a Japanese love hotel. Very romantic. Apparently, they originally planned to just spend a few hours, but actually ended up staying for four days. And fun fact, they apparently started this entire sexual encounter at the restaurant with a full-blown performance by a group of geishas singing a romantic song for them. Meanwhile, his wife is washing dishes and watching this entire thing unfold. Can you imagine? Again, the drama. We're not victim blaming. One more time here, but damn Kajiso. She would later say this about him. It's hard to say exactly what was so good about Ishida, but it was impossible to say anything bad about his looks, his attitude, his skill as a lover, the way he expressed his feelings. I had never met such a sexy man. <laughs> it's kind of easy to forget that this ends with him dead and his uh, dick and balls cut off. Yeah, on April 27th, 1936, the couple rendezvoused again at another hotel. This encounter essentially solidified the deal for Sada, and after this, she was head over heels in love. She had her man, and she wanted him. Kijitsu didn't feel the same way. Shortly after all of this, he returned to his wife. This sent Sada into a huge depressive spiral. And she was the kind of gal where if she couldn't have him, no one else could either. Sada would make sure of that. About a week before that fateful day, she went to go see a play. And not just any play. This play was about a vengeful geisha who attacked her lover with a knife. Sada saw all of this and thought to herself, well, that could work. And, okay, y'all... Things are about to get real sexual here for a minute. Just forewarning <laughs> you. Brace yourselves. Skip ahead if you need to. You're yeah. warning. That is it. Don't listen to this like with your parents. <laughs> or maybe if like, I don't know, your kids are in the car with you. Now is a time to jump ahead a little ways. Yes, exactly. She got in touch with Kijitsu and told him that she was sorry that the two had gotten into a fight. She missed him and she wanted to see him. She suggested that the two meet up for another rendezvous. Kichiso was game, and the two got together in Ogu for a few days of intense lovemaking. During one of their first encounters during this time, Sada brought out a knife, grabbed his penis, and held the knife to the base of it. She told him that she would make sure he would never be with another woman. He thought this was a great joke and laughed with her. Oh, buddy, she's not joking. <laughs> oh, man, hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After about two nights of this, Kichiso suggested to her that they take things to the next level. What he thought the next level at this point was, who can say? Um, but he <laughs> wanted to participate in some good old-fashioned autoerotic asphyxiation. And look, folks... We're not here to yuck anyone's yum. No. You know, whatever you do in the safety and consent of your own home Bless. is carry on. Mm -hmm. However, perhaps you should learn how to do certain things properly, you know, do them safely. Maybe don't do them with someone who just threatened to cut off your genitals. Yeah. But, you know, carry on. Of course, safety is key. On the night of May 16th, 1936... She removed her kimono and proceeded to choke him while they were having sex. Can we take a second and maybe explain this just in case we have some listeners who might be more on the uh, vanilla side of things? Yes, this might be something new to you that uh, maybe those of you who aren't complete deviants and children of the internet. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay, so essentially she is uh, she's cutting off his airflow whenever he orgasms. Apparently this went on for two whole hours. I will say that uh, for a lot of folks who like this kind of thing, the goal is to cut off circulation enough where the person actually passes out for a bit and then they wake up and uh, all is well. 
again, safety first, folks. Yeah. But, um, well, surprise, surprise, two hours of repeated choking eventually led to some problems. She removed the sash from her kimono from around his neck and his face distorted and it became clear that there was a problem. He regained consciousness but told her that he was in a lot of pain. She fed him 30 tablets of a sedative named Calmoin to calm him down and help numb the pain. Allegedly, as he fell asleep, he said the following to her. You'll pull the cord around my neck and squeeze it again while I'm sleeping, won't you? If you start to strangle me, don't stop because it's just so painful afterwards. We know this because in court, she would say that after he said this to her, she took a moment and wondered if he was actually being serious. She thought that he was either joking or that this was his way of asking her to kill him. Now, we all know how this ended, so it is clear to us now that she chose the more dramatic of the two options. She would later say that when she thought about it, he was probably just joking. She wouldn't kill him that night, however. No, she held off for two more nights. On May 18th, her and Kijitsu had another fun-filled day together. And you guys, this dude's still banging her after all of this. Like, please, let that sink in. The thing is, he already told her, like, hey girl, I'm not leaving my wife for you. She was devastated. And then after, she's like, yeah, no, it's fine. Let's just, like, have some time together. And he's like, Okay. Right? He's like, you know what? All right. This is going on for (laughs) days at this point. Well, I'm sorry. Hold on. What's the wife doing? I probably contemplating her entire life, to be honest with you. She's probably like, why am I wasting my time with this philandering dog, basically? She's just like angrily washing dishes back at the restaurant. Like, Oh, oh, poor thing. There's times where, like, I look at certain parts of history and I love the style and the music and, you know, that kind of thing. But it was not a nice time to be a woman in those days, you guys. No. (sighs) They had sex for hours that night until he fell asleep again. Once Sato was certain that he was out, she grabbed her sash once again. She wrapped it around his neck twice and pulled until he was dead. We need to take a second and break this down because it's incredibly difficult to kill someone by strangulation. Yeah, it's harder than you think. It's it's harder than they usually make it seem in like movies and stuff like that, for sure. For starters, they're likely going to wake up and fight back at some point, but it also takes a lot of time. If you think about it, this isn't a common way for women to kill either, which is what makes her stand out from essentially every other woman that we've covered because... Most women are going to kill via poison or just something that's like less hands-on, but Sada was all hands on deck here. Yeah, she, she certainly was. After she killed him, she cuddled with his corpse for hours. And before we get into the next part, we want to share some of her thoughts during this time. In a later interview, she would go on to say... After I killed him, I felt totally at ease, as though a heavy burden had been lifted from my shoulders, and I felt a sense of clarity. And that clarity led to her grabbing a kitchen knife, grabbing on to Kajitsu's penis, and severing it. After that, she held on to his testicles and cut them off too. Sorry to all the fellas that are listening. That's like... If you're not, if your butthole isn't a little clenched right now, like <laughs> you need to listen to that again. Ah, oh, she then ripped the pages out of a nearby magazine and wrapped his genitals up. Using the blood, she wrote "Sada Kichi" together on one of his thighs and "Sada" on the other. Sada then put on his underwear and left with a magazine-wrapped penis and testicles in her kimono. She told the staff at the hotel that her date was resting and not to disturb him under any circumstance. Goro got pulled into this mess once again. She basically just showed up to his house and was crying and saying, I'm so sorry, over and over again. He essentially thought that she had just slept with someone else and felt bad about it, so he comforted her. Poor Goro. Seriously. And side note, he actually basically ruined his entire life for her. 
Word eventually got out that he had had an affair with her and it completely ruined his career, but he still cared about her. I repeat, poor Goro. Luckily, Kachizo's body was found very soon after and Sada became a wanted criminal. This led to the insanity that is her story spreading amongst the public. They would later call this Abe Sada Panic. It actually led to numerous stampedes and injuries. People would say that they saw her and everyone would freak out and it would lead to a huge panic. There were a ton of traffic jams and yeah, seriously, people got injured because of all of this. Yeah, and these are traffic jams in Japan, so please keep that in mind also. Now, you may be wondering, what was our girl, Sada, up to during this time? That's a great question. What was our girl, Sada, up to during this time? Oh, well, you know, she went out, she did some shopping, watched a movie, got a massage, drank a bunch. And reminder, folks, this is all with his genitalia still in her kimono. She would later admit that she also spent a lot of time kissing his penis and uh, putting it in her mouth. Now I get to say... (laughs) Go ahead. The cringy parts. Um, Dear listeners, if you aren't also cringing along with me at this point, if all this has not been that bad to you, she also did admit trying to insert it into herself, her vagina, numerous times. However, because it was obviously flaccid, she wasn't able to successfully use it to masturbate. Go ahead, please. I was just going to say... That is not a sentence I ever pictured myself saying or wanting to say again in the future. You know what? (laughs) 69 episodes ago when we were just starting this up, did you ever think we'd be here talking about this? I just, maybe it's the world I grew up in, but I keep forgetting that this was very much like the 1930s. Yeah. Like World War II has not happened yet, you guys. (laughs) Yeah. And this woman is doing internet levels of batshit insanity. (laughs) (laughs) That's so Uh, accurate. Like, this is something you would think, like, This is Florida, man. Oh, my God. I was just saying that. Great minds think alike, my friend. (laughs) exactly. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, After all of this, she sat down and began to write goodbye letters to her closest friends. She would later say that her plan was to jump off of one of the highest cliffs of Mount Ikoma exactly one week after the murder with his genitals in tow. Again, during all of this time, she is indeed a wanted criminal, and there's a huge amount of resources being used on finding her. Therefore, it didn't really take that long. Investigators showed up at the inn she'd been staying at, and it doesn't seem like she was all that surprised. In fact, she seemed pretty chill about the whole thing. They approached her ready for a fight, and she was essentially like, Bellas, it's all good. I know why you're here. Let's go. She was then interrogated over the course of eight sessions. This would be where we would get the majority of the information regarding the murder. During this time, she admitted that, yes, she killed him, and she did it so that he could never be with another woman again. This was all because she loved him. She knew the relationship was over no matter what she did, and she decided to have him for herself for a few nights before finally saying goodbye to him in a very permanent way. Investigators would note that any time they brought him up or the crime in any way, she would light up and become very energetic. She showed little to no remorse about all this. And again, this shit's bad. Yeah, this is 1930s Japan. Can you imagine the public response once all of this information came out to the public? Craziness. There's so much bad stuff happening in Japan at this point. Like, they're looking at a potential war with China. Political and economic tension made it so that this story was a very, very welcome distraction. And something funny, in a really terrible way, is that because of all of this, everyone thought that he must have had some, like, Rasputin-level dick (laughs) that, like, they needed to find and they needed to preserve for all time, which we're going to get into later, but... She made sure that everyone knew it wasn't actually that big. (laughs) It was, however, preserved and sent to the Tokyo Medical School Pathology Lab, but it was lost after World War II. 
probably with all the skulls we've talked about. I mean, if if it's kind of like when you put socks in the dryer and they just like disappear, they're in that dimension with those. Oh, not with the Hinter Kaifex skulls. Oh, no. <laughs> it's just your uh, odd socks and uh, all the bits and pieces. <laughs> <laughs> The public was not only interested in these crimes, they wanted to know everything about the woman who committed them. They also wanted to see what was going to happen to her. Some of these people were men who wanted to see Sada Abe herself in the flesh, but the majority of people who turned out were actually young women who were absolutely obsessed with her and what she had done. Her trial began on November 25th, 1936, and it was an absolute sensation among the public. Crowds began to gather during the early hours of the day. Many of them had even camped out the night before to ensure that they would be able to see the notorious Sada Abe herself. Not only were people interested in the case because it's obviously like fucked up and it's fascinating and all that, but a lot of people were interested in it because they were uh, they were into it. Oh, my God. Like, even the judge, you guys, admitted oh. that some of the details of this case caused him to experience, and I quote, sexual arousal, which, like, what the fuck? It's called keeping, it's your inside voice. You keep those thoughts inside, people. <laughs> right? They don't need to know you're into it, Mr. Judge. No kidding. Sara Abe would be convicted of second-degree murder as well as the mutilation of a corpse. It's a bit surprising to me that they didn't decide that this was premeditated, but okay. She actually asked for the death sentence, which even the prosecution thought was quite extreme. They only wanted 10 years, which again, for 1930s Japan is shocking. Like, 1930s anywhere, for that matter, like, 10 years, really, for a murder? Well, I would, this was one of, I mean, this whole case is shocking, but what was truly shocking to me was her sentence because I would have thought for sure in Japan at that point in time, it would have been execution for sure. I was shocked by that personally too, because again, I'm sure a lot of you that are listening are like, really? 10 years? That's so like 2023? Well, and not even 10, because after everything was said and done, she was actually given a sentence of six years for the murder and mutilation of Kachizo Ishida. Her sentence would be commuted a few years later by Emperor Jimmu himself to celebrate the 2600th mythical founding of the country of Japan. On May 17th, 1941, Sada Abe was a free woman. And can I just say, like, that was fast. Yes, it all seemed to sort of come to this, uh, dare I say, climax, and then was over very quickly. Right? She was interviewed in 1946 by Ango Sakaguchi. This interview painted her as a feminist icon who is a symbol of freedom and political openness. I'm going to go ahead and say I feel like he's kind of reaching there, but like, do go on. Yeah, I agree. I don't agree with what Sada Abe did to her lover. Um, I think that whole situation should have been over before it ever got to that point. But I think calling her a feminist icon is a bit like calling Eileen Wuornos a feminist icon. And you can go back and listen to that episode if you want to hear our thoughts on it. That is a perfect example. <laughs> <laughs> Completely perfect. Her confession and interrogation were published and turned into a best-selling novel. Sada attempted to escape the public eye and changed her name. She moved to a different part of Japan and would actually sue the writer of the book for defamation. This was settled outside of the courts for an undisclosed amount. She spent much of the following years working at various restaurants and eventually landing a position that she would settle into and stay in for quite a while. During this time, she gave more interviews and also wrote her own book regarding her crimes. Also super funny, but apparently in her later years, she would go to these parties that were really, really extravagant because, okay, she made a fair bit of money off of these interviews. So her life was pretty comfortable. She did this murder. She spent some time in jail and then she was living it up. She was doing fine. But she'd show up at these parties and the men that were in the room would yell, hide the knives anytime she walked by, which like I think is hilarious, but I, she probably liked that a little bit. 
Yeah, I feel like it's probably the opposite of like the Lizzie Borden effect where Lizzie Borden hated it when people brought it up. But I feel like Sada Abe was probably like, yeah, I did it. <laughs> right? Or she was like, hee hee hee. <laughs> totally. She most likely passed away in 1971, but the exact date and cause is still unknown. There are some reports that state she spent her final years in a nunnery, but we aren't quite sure what became of Sada Abe. And that, dear listeners, brings us to the end of the tale of Sada Abe and Charlotte. How the hell are you feeling after that? What do you think? Oh, man, we say this a lot. And I think it's because we try to kind of pick cases that are really interesting. But I don't think I've heard a story quite like this. Seriously, like this story is something else. Like you guys know I love historic cases and I'd obviously consider this a historic case. But this happened almost 100 years ago. And while the name Sada Abe isn't as well known as some of the other ladies we've covered, it should be because this is one of the wildest cases we've ever talked about. I I would have to agree. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as wild and crazy as it was. Just a few quick reminders before we go for the day. We do have some new merch up on our thread list. So you guys should go check that out. It's down in the description below or the link is in all of our social media bio. So you can go check that out. Uh, what else? Oh, yes, of course. We want to give a huge thank you to our beautiful grim VIPs and up. Yes, and a reminder that if you want your name mentioned at the end of our episodes and also access to a ton of amazing content, you can find it at patreon.com slash the grim curriculum. That's patreon.com slash T-H-E-G-R-I-M-C-U-R-R-I-C-U-L-U-M. Just in case you're wondering how to spell curriculum because (laughs) not many people get it right. (laughs) Here we go. Thank you to Bob, Lisa, Pink Flamingo 20, Atlantean Jedi, Brian, Hillary, Judy, Kevin, and Mayhem Mudkip. You guys are the bomb.com, the titty city. You know how awesome you are. Thank you so much for all of your support. Thank you all so, so, so much for listening. This has been The The Grim Grim Curriculum. Curriculum. Dina, did you know, you know the artist Michelangelo, famous in uh, the Vatican for the Sistine Chapel and all those good things? Of course. He wore his boots so long that they actually fused to his feet. Oh, that's so fucking gross. What? (laughs) The artist Raphael actually has him depicted in one of his pieces of art. And every other person in the art piece is barefoot except for his character, (laughs) which is wearing boots. (laughs) Ew. Nasty. Bye. Bye.